Hello out there, Collector's Maze. I'm here with Effie Ukumra. And I, as you guys know, I let my guests announce themselves. So Effie, if you want to take the wheel. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Effie Ukumra. Um, I am an actor, voiceover artist, and I guess I used to call myself an interdisciplinary artist. Um, haven't delved into that much lately, but still am at heart. Um, I also am a writer um, uh, from Australia, Ghanaian descent, very strong connection to my Ghanaian heritage, and I'm so happy to be here. I can't even think of what else to say, so yeah. we'll leave it at that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So first, uh, we have some congratulations. You completed the trifecta, <laughs> Miss Swing of the Harry Potter, the Cursed Child Aussie edition. Yes. Congratulations. Talk about that thank and talk you. about your experience with that. Oh, thank you. Um, being on Cursed Child is has is something of a, of a dream, I would say. Um, you know, I am one of those um, performers that have always wanted to perform. And that's a, that's a dream that everybody knows. And I found over my career, it was really hard to say or believe that I had a career because I am West African descent living in Australia where, you know, honestly, there were so few roles for any of us. That's changed in the last, um, I'm going to say the dr drastically in the last four years. I left the country for 10 years, came back a few times. But in the last four years, it's just been a huge rise in roles for Black actors and actresses. Um, and, and in terms of rise, I don't just mean availability of parts, but variety and diversity in the roles that we can play. Um, and so coming back into the industry and then getting into such a huge cat, like it's canon, you know, it's, it's, it's got, it's the book fans, which I was, my, my siblings and I grew up with the Harry Potter books. We all read them and waited for the next one to come out. Um, I wasn't a film fan. I didn't watch the films till I got this gig, but um, I knew the films were out. Yeah, <laughs> I was a bit of a book purist. Um, I wanted Harry to have green eyes and I understand Daniel Radcliffe couldn't wear contacts. So I was like, forget <laughs> that, I'm not watching it. Um, <laughs> um, but also because I believe in the power of the imagination and I felt like the films take takes that away from a lot of young people. Um, but then having a chance to be in it and to be able to even submit to audition for Hermione Granger, who for me as a reader, I always read as a POC. Um, and so when the opportunity came and I saw that I could submit to audition, I was like, well, of course, <laughs> um, getting cast as a cover for Hermione was already huge. Um, so being able to actually debut in that role in Australia as a Ghanaian woman, like, it, meant, it means so much. Groundbreaking. Um, yeah, in many ways. And, you know, it's one of those things where um, it might not be spoken about in that way, but it is. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I've achieved that, um, you know. Yeah, that I've, <laughs> that God gave me the, the chance like whew. yeah happy absolutely. days <laughs> absolutely so uh I, as a swing how many roles were you prepared for so i'm one of the lucky ones i'm gonna say i only have three roles that i cover um so i'm an uh adult ensemble ensemble swing sorry so that means i cover the two female ensemble which is madam hooch and the trolley witch and then i cover one principal which in my case is um hermione granger so that's my coverage. Um, I've had a great run of, of the Trolley Witch. I, that was my first, uh, the first track to, to debut. And it was, I think, really early on in the process. Um, I had barely teched the role and they were, they were like, you're on. <laughs> um, and then Hooch came a bit later and is one of my favorite tracks. She's, Hooch is a, a, a riot. I love playing Hooch. So yeah, so three. Nice. So how did you get into theater? Is it something that you've always done? Or I, I know you kind of, I, I, I feel the creative vibes coming off you. Did you grow up creative or did you kind of develop into that? I definitely grew up creative. Um, I come from a family of 
mm, naturally creative, but also very uh, vocal people, um, you know, journalists, activists. Um, uh, my great, great grandma was a caterer in that, you know, she was cooking for everyone um, in our hometown. Um, and so I think being in front of people, around people, speaking, creating was not nothing that we shied away from. I know my parents wanted me to go into law or journalism, um, <laughs> but um, the push to, to perform was and create with my hands was always, it always overtook that. Um, so I guess when I was in high school in Australia, we have this really great education system where we literally have something called pathways. So in, in, it's to say that there's more than one way to get a degree and there's more than one way to get into a position in any industry. And so through that, in high school, we do something we call work experience, which is um, when you reach the age of 15 and then through to your, so that's year 10 for us, and then through to graduating year, which is year 12, um, you have to like apply for jobs or work experience. So an, a field that you'd like to work in, they ask you to apply for um, two different two week periods and you go into the workplace and you experience it. And that's supposed to help you form an idea of, is this something I really want to do? Do I see myself here? Do I want to study at uni for three to four years or 10 years to get here or not? And that was helpful for me because for me, it was either the arts or hospitality um, because I, I have a, a customer service background. I love people. I love cooking. Um, and the, I did, I think, two five-star hotels and sort of a workers' club, which is like a a local club for people to come and eat and have events. And that was when I was like, nope, don't do commercial kitchens. <laughs> I love cooking and creating, but I do not want to see a barrel of onions that I have to peel um, for 10 years till a chef says, you can be a chef now. So that was that was what made my decision. And I was like, I want to pursue, pursue the arts full time. Not any easier, mind you. Nope. <laughs> um, the challenges were still real and in many ways I think I was quite optimistic in 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 the face of very real challenges um but I'm I'm glad I stuck to it and I believe it'll come to a point where it's like yeah this was worth all of that time yeah absolutely gotta believe gotta believe so you said that you it, it sounds like you got this creative vibe, but you're going in multiple directions. Talk about the clothing, the brand you uh, from Ghana. Yeah. Um, so I first went to Ghana in 98 with my parents. They took my siblings and I there, um, or, you know, uh, on a really lovely holiday where we got to meet all our family around the world. Um, Ghana was so fun for us, even though it was a culture shock for my parents. They had left 16 years before and a lot had changed. Um, they didn't recognize the city they had left. And so it was really hard for them. But we, you know, their friends and and um, sort of what it's become was, was still fun. So I went back in 2009 with a whole bunch of friends um, in December, which now is sort of like a, you know, a yearly pilgrimage that people are now making to Ghana at the end of the year for what they call debt to December um, to party hard. But before it was that, we were just traveling there. And I was like, oh, this is so fun. I think I want to live here. And I think within two years, um, about five out of the seven of us that had gone had moved to Ghana. Wow. Um, because there's, you know, when you come from a diaspora point of view, especially Australia, like we have such a different way of seeing things. We see gaps and we see spaces where we can fit and we do it um, without necessarily documenting or, um, you know, a lot of the American and the British returnees would make a YouTube channel and everything. And the Aussies were like, we're just here doing it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yep, I can see that. But, um, yeah, but what I learned in my time there was um, very early on, 09, when I went back in 2010, 
and then 12 was I was used to shopping in a way where I could walk into the store and there was size range if it was sold out in your size okay but you knew that it came in your size and um if you were shopping at a bougie boutique which <laughs> you weren't um <laughs> that's when you knew that you know it's custom made or whatever um so I would walk into shops that were called boutiques but were really now that now that I know um like bougie thrift stores because people would go and get secondhand clothing, package it well, and then put them in in a shop. Mm -hmm. So there was no size range, no guarantee of anything. They weren't coming from anywhere or being manufactured. It was just whatever was there was there. And I found it really disconcerting because I couldn't build a cohesive wardrobe. I, the things I liked weren't in my size. It was just confusing and I really didn't like it. So I talked to, shopping in bulk on my trips back home and then <laughs> stretching my outfits for like a few years. There you go. There you go. Um, so I would come back and shop. And then at a point I realized people liked what I was wearing. So I would buy, you know, three or four items in the size range and then take them home and resell them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was when I was like, oh, this could work, but I don't want to sell necessarily made in China you know um, stuff I want stuff that's made here because there are so many amazing tailors and seamstresses Ghana is very much a custom-made society which is why the boutiques are that way because people go with their fabric this is the style I want make it for me Um, so I was like there's a way of tapping into the local industry and and trying to build something from there so that's where Casio Jemima came from. So yeah. with them bringing the fabric, was it, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I'm i working on my education on, on that part of the world. I'm, I'm working on that. But uh, were some of the fabrics uh, family related, like a certain family would have certain colors or patterns? Okay, um, not necessarily. Not in Ghana, okay. Um, so in Ghana, we don't, as far as I know, and if anyone Ghanaian listens and, and knows, I stand corrected if you if I need to be. <laughs> as far as I know, we don't uh, necessarily work with family cloth the way maybe you would see like with Scottish clans, you know, the Scots tartan yeah. is by the clan. Um, we, the closest thing to that we have is kente. And kente was originally woven for, um, Asante kings and chiefs um, and each one had a message embedded into the design um, and so now you know over, over the decades um, you'll find that there are particular prints that have a particular name and uh, sorry not prints um, weave which over time um, you know turned into a big industry for the Chinese they would come in look at the kente prints and then just reproduce them on cheaper fabric, gotcha. which people were now like, oh, it's African print, but mm-hmm. really those had meaning to them. Um, similar to that is the wax prints in Ghana. Um, we the, the Dutch brought wax printing to the, to the continent, um, especially the West African side. And they also brought their what they felt was a more modest form of clothing. So a blouse and a skirt, which in Ghana we called kaba and slit, which I think um, is like a bastardization of a Dutch word, like kaba slot or something like that. Basically a top and a skirt, which is what people will see now and be like, oh, that's a traditional, you know, West African outfit. Mm -hmm. But with that, um, we took on the wax printing method. Um, Some say it was, influence from Indonesia and Batik um, but we also had our own methods where uh, a, a symbol like an Idinkra symbol which you might be familiar with a lot of um, Americans will use Sankofa or Jinyami so they would use Idinkra symbols or um, another sort of symbol to make a statement so there's a really popular one with a bird inside a circle that flying across that you might have seen um, in your mind's eye, you're like, oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Um, that was actually a print called Sikatu, which literally meant 
money flies. Hmm. Um, and so people would wear these cloths on particular occasions. So if somebody's died, a family would choose a particular symbol with uh, like a proverb, hmm. like um, something like a great oak has fallen or a great woman is gone, um, that kind of thing. And that will be the symbol for that. So for a lot of our great grandmothers, that would be how they remember an event. Okay, this is the cloth I wore for so so and so's funeral. Oh, and that's how we would know what year something happened in because we don't record the way, you know, Europe does. Yeah. Um. So those are the closest I can get to that oh, question. But thank of you. course, aesthetics is part of it. You know, people will buy something they think is nice. Um. And these days, there's a wealth of Hollandaise, as they call it, which is the Dutch wax prints, a wealth of Chinese prints. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few companies in Ghana and Ivory Coast that make um, specific prints um, and will not repeat them to avoid that re mass reproduction. Yeah. So there's a company called Woodin. They, once you've bought it and it's finished, that's it. You'll not mm -hmm. see it reproduced anywhere. Um, and that's how they maintain integrity over the the designs and ownership over the designs. Yeah. So the words that you were using, was that Twee? Um, which one? The, the, well, um, uh, the uh, well, there's just the numer the, the, I'm sorry. So basically the, just the, the, the words you were using, like the genuine words, the authentic words for those items. Was that okay. Twee or was some um, of it? So Kente, I believe is an, um, a kind word. So tree is kind of like now sort of the most common uh, language associated with Ghana. Okay. Um, and it's one of the easiest to get around with. Um, and most people don't know that tree in itself has three or four dialects. Okay. And it's actually part of a language called Akan. Okay. And so in Akan, you have Asante tree, Equapem tree, um, Bono Fanti and Queu tree. And so um, depending on which which Akan uh, group you belong to, so I'm a Fanti, so Fantis will pronounce some of the words differently. So you can know that it's the same language, but it's a little different because of the dialect or the part of the country you live in. Um, so Kente, as far as I know, comes from the word for a basket, Kente which is um, woven as well. Um, but the beauty of Ghana that a, a lot of people miss out on hearing just because there is a saturation of tree-based um, culture is that, you know, we have over 55 languages in the country. Exactly, um, 55 languages and cultures. So there are things you might hear and think it's um, an Ashanti or a, um, Ashanti culture, but it's actually Ga or Ewe and mm. so on. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty, what's the word? I, I am intentional about saying that about Ghana because I think um, diversity is important, especially with countries that were built out of colonialism. Um, and so if no one tells anyone, then all people will know about the country is like, whatever someone is brave enough to put out exactly yeah, exactly but there's so much to learn about every every country um especially ghana it's very very diverse that's that's incredible because you think of like a, a country like the united states you, we speak english from you know every corner but 55 languages that's incredible and yeah, 55, I mean, that's 55 yeah, cultures yeah exactly blended and together in each of them it's like very different you know um Fanti has a few different dialects uh, dialects as well. Mm -hmm. And from my hometown to the next hometown, there are different cultural practices depending on where our ancestors came from before they got there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so interestingly, what you said about America, it's like, even though English is the language of the United States, mm -hmm. the way English is spoken in Alabama is a hundred percent different to how it's working in Georgia, or to how it's working in New York, yes. um, and parts of New York, true. right? That's true. Um, and in a sense, that's cultural practice. It's cultural development. Um, 
and so yeah, uh, I I love I love conversations no, like abso that. No, absolutely, absolutely, I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's incredible. So, when you travel there, do you only go to your hometown, or like, it sounds like you probably bounce around a little bit? Actually, for the majority. Um, Depend okay, let me be honest. Depending <laughs> on which part of the country you come from, yeah. not everyone will go to their hometown. Okay. And so I don't necessarily have that privilege just because um we are also matrilineal, but uh, depending on the culture you're from. So Akans are matrilineal. That means we take our hometown and our um ethnicity from our mother. Okay. So if my dad was an Ashanti and my mom is Fanti, I would identify as a Fanti. Okay. Um, even though I'm Fantash, as they say, mm -hmm. they like to say, which is a mix of the two. Um, because my mother is Fanti. And that comes from um there are different uh ideas of why, but most people will say it's because back in the day, um a lot of you know, before colonization we were different nations at, at war for emp empire building. Sure. And so if the men were off at war, you couldn't always tell who a child's father was, but you always know who the mother is. So we take from the mother. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, my hometown is my mom's hometown, um, but it's an old town. It was um, big in the in that um, it's a coastal town, quite close to a lot, a few slave castles. Um, and if you are interested in or have read a bit about the transatlantic slave trade, um, you'll know that in many parts of the Caribbean, they have what they call Coromanti people. And what that means is they came from a fort, they, they, they were dispatched from a fort called Koromansi, which mm. is in um, just outside my hometown. Okay. Um, and so you can imagine historically, each part of Ghana has its time when it was a hub or, you know, um, bustling with business. And then obviously things would die down as things moved on. So um, my hometown was settled, you know, around my great, great grandmother's time when people moved to that area um but um nowadays it's not like a big city mm -hmm. it's very much a, a town and so if, if i'm not with my mom i won't just rock up and be like hey everybody because right. they'll be like who are you and why are you here mm -hmm. um so i actually go to accra which is the capital mm -hmm. and um accra is um the hometown of the Ga people um, and so um, they have their own you know language um, culture um, way of doing things the history there the connection there is to Danish traders mm. um, yeah mainly Danish um, and um, Dutch trading in that area so yeah that's where I, I live when I go to Ghana just a second, cut that off. Sure. So, all right. So, we got to talk about Valorant as much as yeah, we could talk that's for, for exactly. We could <laughs> we, we could talk forever about our cultures. Um, how did that come about? I mean, I uh, did you do any other voiceovers prior to? Tell me how that came about. It's so weird. So, um, I I wouldn't have considered myself a voiceover artist mm -hmm. just because I was in spaces where it wasn't necessary. And excuse me, I have uh I have had to learn how to use my voice because naturally it's quite high and wispy, I think. And so <laughs> through my actors training, it was always an issue. Like I you need to ground your voice if you know. Um so I had to learn how to do that. And so I didn't really believe in my voice, really, my speaking voice. Um, and then when COVID hit, the theatre company I was working for started doing radio dramas, um, producing radio drama. And, um, yeah, it was fun. I got to voice a few characters and produce a few episodes for that. And it really sort of 
I gained a lot of confidence in that. Um, and so I think it was just after sort of, just as COVID was getting, loosening its grip a bit on Ghana, a friend of mine called and was like, there's a radio drama that's um, got their auditioning for. Um, do you want to audition? And I was like, oh, okay, sure. Like I've been doing that for a few months. Why not? So I got to the the house they were auditioning at and she was like, oh, it's actually not a radio drama. And I was like, well, then <laughs> what is it? She was like, oh, it's, 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 it's toys. It's a game. It's something. And I, was like, <laughs> I was like, what? And the people that were there were like, yeah, Effie, we're sure you'll get this because it's just toys. It's toys. It's just kid stuff. And I was like, toys. Um, so I was like, okay, whatever. I don't get it, but I'll go in the room and see what they say. So when I walked in, that's when they were like, so there's this game. Have you heard of, you know, League of Legends? And I was like, I have. And they're like, yeah. So they're releasing Ghanaian Agent. And I was like, yo, this is awesome. Yes, <laughs> yes. Like, what? Um, I think Black Panther had come out that year. So when I saw the mock-up of, the original mock-up of Astra, I was screaming. I was like, <laughs> you I was like, you don't even know what this, <laughs> do you know what this is? Um, so yeah, there and then I was like, okay, Lord, I really would love to get this. So just help me out here. Um, and weirdly, I was in the room with the other voice actor of like, I had to sit in, while she did her audition, and I was like, this is weird. I should have been. <laughs> uh, and she was really good. And so um, it later on, I, I found out it came down to the two of us, um, and and I got it. But I, it felt right, you know. Um, when when I got in and saw it, I understood what the, what the girls outside meant. Um, and I was like, oh, I, I think Asher is so cool. We have so many similarities. In terms of the character breakdown, I was like, oh, I, I really want this. Um, and I got it. <laughs> yeah. So did you did you bring your knowledge with that? Because I know when you said 55 languages kind of regionalized with, within Ghana. Did you kind of bring that information to the table and they go, oh, yeah, enhance this a little bit for us? Okay, yeah. I, and I will say, I know I talk a lot and I read a lot and talk a lot more, but I don't know at all. And especially- But you are knowledgeable. But you are That's knowledgeable. Right. You're, you know more than I do. You probably know more than 95% of the whole entire world about, you, 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 you have read into and you're knowledgeable about what you want to be knowledgeable about and you have it. So I defer true. and That's all should true. defer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all that to say is, um, you know, growing up in Australia, English still very much is my my predominant strongest communication mode. My tree is uh, manageable. Um, gotcha. <laughs> you know, one thing about our languages is they're tonational and Austra Australian English is not. You can speak Australian English with no tone. Um, and so what that does is literally change our mouth mm -hmm. for picking up or, or understanding tone. And so um, speaking different Ghanaian languages is a challenge for me because I, I have to think tonally and hear it while saying it, which is not always quite right. So in that sense, I was nervous um, mm -hmm. because I wanted to represent the, la the, the, the accent as well as I could. Um, and so in many ways, I thought I wouldn't get it for that because my accent is not as authentic as the people I was I was auditioning with, absolutely. Um, and so I what I had to do was open myself up to asking questions, which is good, um, and receiving guidance, with, which is what I did with um, the engineer who helped record because we had to record in Accra. Um, they needed very specific tech. They had very specific technical requirements for the mics and the set, the space set up and so on. And by God's grace, we found I, I, um, we found an engineer who had all the things we needed. Um, and he his name is Kofi. He was able to help me through with anything that I was like, I don't know if I'm saying this right or if I've got the meaning as it is um and he would confirm or go no actually it's 
it, the tone goes up here or down there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the great thing about working with Riot is they're like, this is what we have, but you need to help us out with the actual, you know, saying of it. So there are a few lines where I would give what the line was and then I would give a, a modification or um, a suggestion. Um, and in some cases they took the alternative, like what I had offered um, instead. So yeah. Awesome. So open to input, very important to, the, to, uh, to them to get that authenticity, which is awesome. And to hear that yeah. it was actually recorded in Accra. Accra? Is that how you say it? Accra. 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 That makes it even more special. So. That's pretty cool. So yeah. one last thing, if you could Ooh. tell anyone as with someone who, who grew up creative, you, if, going through the struggles, talk about talk, like speak as if you're talking to someone who is going to go through those struggles and how it's, how it's worth it. And just kind of encourage someone who would be getting into any kind of creative space or even voice acting. Yeah. Um, from a personal point of view, I, I would say you've got to have faith in what you believe your calling is. I um, obviously can tell I am a very spiritual person. Um, I am a Christian. And so for me, my faith is what has helped ground me in what I believe about myself. And, you know, it's a strong belief that everyone has a purpose and a calling. And um, for some of us, it's to be in a particular profession, you know, to help people out. For others, it's to help people laugh, smile, whatever that purpose is. Um, and so I feel like standing strong in your convictions about who you are, who you're meant to be, and keeping that that version of yourself in mind, knowing that um, you, you, you have to go through certain difficulties and challenges to build a sense of character because that's what will help you when the time comes to write that poem or, you know, paint the, the, the painting that you've been thinking about. Like, it sounds a bit wishy-washy, but I know for me that's what's gotten me through is knowing that this is what I was made for. I believe I was created to perform, whether that's vocally or through dance or through acting or through craft. And so um, for me, that's the, that's a major thing. You've got to have that belief. And so if your belief is not spiritual based, spirituality based, faith based, believe in your inner conviction um, about what you want to do and, and don't give up. Um, try and be as wise as you can at any point in time in terms of, do I need to survive? Yes. <laughs> and so do I, if I, like, do I have to pick up a job in an industry I'm not, that I'm good at, but not interested in for a little bit? Do it whilst you're auditioning, you know, get the agent, audition, work in the office or in the, the fast food shop or in the call center, because again, you'll never know when you'll get an audition for something. And they'll be like, do you have, do you know how to take a call? Like a thing is like, well, actually that's what go. I've been doing. Yeah, and so then uh cut here obviously sorry um the zoom it's a 45 minute window we talked a little bit beforehand so uh marker 34 minutes around there i am so sorry adrian i know you're gonna watch this um i'm sorry i'll send i'll, I'll get another one going Okay, so end this one. And.
and schedule a meeting. FE part two. You can still hear my voice. Oh, sorry, pal. We'll schedule it to 11, save, close, okay. All right, pal. Again, if you see this one, snap 34. Three, three, four, three, four minutes. Unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, unique New York. I keep eating this as one file because you can fix it. No, 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 no. Sorry. Don't hate me. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. Annie, are you okay? Annie, are you okay? Are you okay, Annie? You've been hit by a changing You've been struck by no smooth in my head. Oh my god, I talk so much. Sorry. You no, know, you're fine. We had pro. I don't know where it went. So, <laughs> um, so basically, the last thing uh, I think you were saying was the obstacles, and we'll um, we'll edit around it. Yeah. Okay. So I was saying that um, the obstacles I I feel become what makes a toolbox for you. So like um. Once you overcome something, you put like a, a, a lesson into that toolbox. Like, oh, I remember feeling so sad that I wanted to. Oh, I remember that I, I had to pull myself together by. And that becomes like your toolbox of things that when the time comes, whether it means performing or like I said before, making something or just talking to someone else who's a creative, you can be like, well, these are things I used or, oh yeah, I'm going to go back and pick that up to portray that character or, oh yeah, this is what I did to get through that really hard time. And you find that it just um, gives your career flavor. And that's the thing. Like if you don't have a story to tell, no one's going to listen. <laughs> so, you know, don't be afraid of, of the journey. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Effie, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the excellent conversation. I feel like we're going to be talking to you in the future after you do something else incredible. Uh, <laughs> congratulations again on tonight on completing the trifecta of swing. Oh my gosh. I can't, I couldn't imagine winning eight months to perform, but you got to do it. That's awesome. Thank you so much for having me on this and for all the patience. I know my <laughs> Timing hasn't been easy to catch at all, but um, it's such a joy and um, privilege and honor to speak to people, especially people interested in this world. I find gamers so, so fascinating in terms of how you approach life and um, and give 
So thank you. Um, it's, it's been amazing. Thanks again. Mm-hmm. <laughs>